Hard to believe that we're actually entering our final sermon in this series this morning. In our series, in the Psalms of Ascent, we've called it the Songs for the Journey. And uh, we are entering our last sermon of this series this morning. And we've talked about this already in several services and messages, but sometimes we don't see them all. We miss a week or so, and perfectly good. One of the things that we've talked about is these, these 15 psalms, and we haven't had time to go through all of them, but these 15 psalms were believed and, and generally recognized to be done and sung and, and recited as the people of Israel gathered together, and they made these three journeys to Jerusalem for these required feasts. And, uh, and it, we'll kind of see how that ties in, how important that is in this psalm this morning. And uh, so these psalms were, are also, as we noted, really throughout this entire series so far, these are very applicable still for us today. And it's a, it's a, it's a common adage, and it's a common thing that we, we talk about, but our lives are journeys, right? I think we can agree with our lives are journeys. And we go through this journey, and sometimes difficulties come across during those journeys in various different ways, and each of us are affected in different types of ways and have our own challenges to overcome. And it's, it's no surprise that that's part of that journey. And really, when we, we have that journey and we go through that journey, to me, there's no better way to do that than with family and, and, and even with my church family here today as well. And we have this journey, and we're going through this, and we all know that that final destination is eternity with the Father. And then in, in any time I go through some sort of struggle, I, I try to remember that as best I can, that our end result is that eternity with the Father. That's where we are heading. And all these things that come up along the way are just things that come up along the way to that final resting place where we get to spend eternity with the Father without those struggles, without that pain, and without those, those hurts that we go through. And as we, of course, know, that means our journey is not without hardships. And we've seen that all throughout all of these psalms so far, I think. I think we've seen that very closely here, that this destination, wherever it is, sometimes it's difficult to get there, and and, and we have to do that together. The psalmist, I think, though, did a really good job, each and every one of them, some unknown, some by Solomon, some credited to David. All of these psalmists in this series have done a really good job of reminding us of that hope that we have. That hope we have in a Father who cares for us. That God cares for each and every one of you individually and collectively as a people. And I think the psalmists have done a really good job of pulling that out of each and every one of these psalms and helping us to see that and hopefully giving us comfort in the the long run. We're going to be in the 133rd Psalm this morning. Psalm 133, as we kind of close out this series. And in this psalm, we're going to see kind of what one of these marks is of a Christian that pleases the Lord. This is something that pleases God, what we're going to talk about this morning. And that, that, that object and that thing that we can do, it's uh, surrounded by unity. And there's various ways we can look at unity. We can look at it as just being together, togetherness, uh, brotherhood, fellowship, sisterhood. These are things that please God. And I think we're going to hopefully see that very clearly this morning. Think about it. We've all seen it. We've probably all experienced it. We've all been in toxic workplaces. We've heard of toxic workplaces. We've seen and, and maybe have a, a terrible, horrible neighbor or a horrible landlord that we have to deal with. I'm sure we've all dealt with that. Maybe you, you're, you come from a broken marriage or a broken family, or maybe there's people around you that are broken These are just general relationship problems that we do deal with on a regular basis. It's inevitable. I was thinking about that, and I've said this before, not maybe not here too much, but I've said it in my life before. When you get two imperfect people trying to come together and do something perfect, the result is imperfect. You can't get two imperfect people to make something perfect. We all need that third party and and the father that's going to make that work for us. So if I told you this, that unity is something that pleases God, just that simple phrase and truth, that unity pleases God in all relationships, ask yourself this, does that change how you respond to others? Does that change how you deal with other individuals inside and outside of the church? Let's go ahead and read Psalm 133. Let's see what David has to say about this. Psalm 133 starts this way. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. 
It is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls in the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, live forevermore. Short and sweet, three verses. We'll spend about 20 minutes on each verse. <laughs> Sweden, right? Just a wonderful psalm. Here's the main idea. I'm going to jump right into it. main idea this morning is when the church is united, the Lord blesses. When the church is united, the Lord blesses. I capitalize the word church because I want to emphasize we're not talking about Thorningdale Family Church particularly. We're talking about the universal church. We're talking about the church of God, God's people united. And David uses, obviously, some interesting pictures in this psalm, just as we've seen in others, these interesting pictures that really don't make a whole lot of sense to us on the surface, but just as a reminder that people that he wrote these during that time and the ones who were were reciting this on their way to Jerusalem, they understood these things. They understood what these pictures meant, so we're going to dive into that as well. And we're going to answer two specific questions this morning. We're going to look at two specific questions. The first one is this, why Christians should be together. Why should Christians be together? ESV reads that phrasing at the beginning of this psalm, brothers dwell in unity. And in the original text, it probably reads a little bit closer to brothers dwell together in unity. And even the same word uh, that's used for together is the same word that's used for unity. So if I want to take it even more literally, brothers dwell together together. It's a little redundant, so obviously the translators in the English decided to to make that a little bit easier to read. And I'm sure we've met them, Christians who are not involved in a local church, Christians who actually don't even get involved and associate with other Christians. We've all seen that. I'm sure we've all experienced those individuals. They believe in God, but they don't really believe in the church. They believe in God, and maybe they don't even like church people. And it's unfortunate if you think about how that implies and what the implication is. And I think John, the Apostle John, makes a very strong warning against people like that. In John chap- uh, 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, he says these words. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that whomever loves God must also love his brother. Those are strong words from the apostle, right? One, the apostle that we, we know as the apostle of love. He says, you are a liar if you say you love God, but you hate your brother. If you're married, think about that. And I think Pat's used this illustration before, but if you're married, think about it. If somebody loves you but hates your spouse, isn't that problematic? Because you're one. God said when you're married, you've united and you are one. You are one flesh. So when someone hates you or loves you but hates your spouse, that's problematic, isn't it? And as the bride of Christ, the church, as the bride of Christ, the church and being a Christian should go hand in hand. And that's why we always encourage you to be with brothers and sisters and worship together. And I think we see at least two things from this psalm that helps us to see this and answers that question for us. I think the first thing we see is that it pleases God. It pleases God. David says here that it is good and pleasant. Good and pleasant when brothers unite. And it's good because what it does is it reflects the heart of God and his purpose of unity amongst his people. And we also, if you think about it, there's there's an example there of God's character particularly when it comes to the triune nature of God, the Godhead, right? You have these three figures of the Godhead united from creation until he returns and everything in between, perfectly united. No, nothing in between there that causes any kind of friction or rift, but these three members of the Godhead working in unity from creation until the day he returns to bring us back. And we see that all throughout the scriptures. And this is reflected perfectly if you've, if you've read or are familiar with John's letter. John 17 is the high priestly prayer of Christ. We're going to touch on that a little bit later, so we won't go there now. But it's so perfectly reflected in that, in that prayer. And think about it. Three times a year, these feasts were required, and the people had to go to Jerusalem to observe these feasts and worship. 
So God made this a point that he was going to require this of all the people three times a year to come together and to go to Jerusalem to worship the same God. Isn't that neat how he purposely created this function for that reason? At this point, if you look at the history of Israel, they were, they were actually a very diverse people at this point in their, in their existence. They came from different regions, different tribes, different occupations. And I'll stop there for a moment. Look around you. We can mirror that exact description. Different tribes, different regions, different occupations. And we're all united under Christ, the head of this church. And they came together to worship the same God. And I love that picture we see there. And that's what, re- re- what unites us. That's what brings us together as a, as a holistic body of Christ is that we are united under him. And it's pleasant. So he, the psalmist David says it was good. He also says it was pleasant. It was pleasant because it la- makes life more enjoyable than those seasons where it's dominated by conflict. Israel, of course, is no stranger to conflict, were they? They were no stranger to conflict. This goes all the way back, if you think about it, of the first family and all the families that followed. Cain and Abel. Abraham and Lot had some problems, didn't they? Moses, he had issues with his brother and sister, Miriam and and Aaron. They had issues with Moses. David's kids had issue with David. We see this example time and time again. And I think what it does, if we use that and see that closely, it kind of speaks to this idea that that conflict has to be put aside for the purpose of unity. When you can put aside something and say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about this anymore because all it's doing is is causing rift and it's causing issues within us, that's when we have to put those things aside for the purpose of unity. As a manager of people in my previous career, I couldn't tell you how many times that I had my time dominated by conflict between two employees. And sometimes it was silly stuff. Time was dominated, and there were times where I just literally sat there and said, can't you just get along for the next six to eight hours? Can't you just get along for the next six to eight hours, not for me, not even for you, but for your coworkers and the customers that you're impacting? can't you just do that? I joked on Monday with the guys, like, maybe, maybe Rodney King was right. Can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? And I'm thinking about that too. Parents, isn't it neat when your children get along? At whatever age that might be, isn't it just pleasant and joyful when your, your kids are getting along? I can remember my brother and I, we're very different kids, very different kids, and I remember there was this one time my, my, my brother and I were helping my dad move into an apartment, and my brother and I were just going at it all day long, just driving my dad through the roof. We were just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it was a time we're all sitting in the living room. He literally reached into a box, and he grabbed two sets of boxing gloves, handed it to my brother and I, said, all right, go for it then. My brother and I were like, really? Are you, uh, guess what? We didn't even want to. We were bickering all day long. We didn't even want to fight about it, even though my dad was giving us permission to do so. Nowadays, gratefully, he's, we have a great relationship. We share a lot of the same interests. At least we share a lot of the same kind of life, right? We, we share, you know, we, we, we're united because we're both married and have children, have careers, right? We're more similar now than we were when we were kids, and, and it's allowed us to be united more, and we get along great. Of course, being a big brother that he is, of course, he tries to push my buttons as much as he can, sometimes very successfully. Right, Natalie? (laughs) But I love that. When parents get along, when when children see that their parents get along, it, it is such a blessing. Just last week, Sunday morning after church or Sunday afternoon, go into the living room and, and Elizabeth and Gabrielle are cuddled up on the couch together. It's like, ah, just a joy to see. It's just a joy to see. And it gives us joy, hopefully, when we see that. And the thing about God as that example, as our Heavenly Father, when he sees his churches getting along, when he sees his people getting along, that gives him joy, as we've seen in this psalm. And we're going to see how that's kind of done. We're going to answer that second question a little bit later, but we're going to see how that's done. But I think for now, we can really just appreciate the fact that when God sees his people getting along, again, regardless of if they're in the same building or otherwise, 
let's appreciate the fact that it pleases the Father. It pleases him. Next thing we see here is that the Lord blesses it. So we see that it, it, makes, it pleases him, but he also blesses that. David uses, again, these two illustrations, these two pictures that are kind of strange to us. The first one is, is the anointing oil that's in verse 2. And there's this picture of this anointing oil that's dripping down the beard and the collar of Aaron. And, and, and I don't know about you, but the first picture I got were those shampoo commercials where the hair is just dripping down. It's not like that. That's not what he was talking about. He, he, this is actually a very special oil. This is an anointing oil that if you can trace its roots all the way back to Genesis or Exodus chapter 29 and 30. We won't go there. There's a lot of information there. But there it was a very special blended oil that was specifically created for the purpose of anointing. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. Anointing Aaron, the other priests, and all of the special and holy things that were used in the act of worship in the tabernacle. So it was specifically designed for that purpose. And Aaron is mentioned here by name, more likely just as a representation of the priesthood. Maybe not Aaron specifically, but as a representation of the priesthood. And if you look at the picture of oil throughout the scriptures, it is, there's a lot of different meanings, um, obviously to include the anointing of the priests and the prophets, and later on the apostles. All is alluded here in this psalm. But it's also throughout scripture referencing and speaks to the Holy Spirit. And we see that because the idea of anointing is to set aside, to set apart, to make special and to prepare something for service, something for ministry. And that's what we see the picture of here. It's to bless it, it's to empower it, and it's also a sign and picture of God's presence on that individual who has been set aside. And remember the word holy, remember that word. That means that, that we've been set aside. And that's exactly what we see here. It's, it's that picture there. So the first blessing for those who are united under the Father is the anointment of those individuals. And that includes you and I. And the next blessing is found in, in verse 3, and it's that picture of, of dew. And that's an interesting picture for us as well, but depending on your translation, it might include the, the word mount or mountain right in front of it, or it may not, but it is a mountain, and it's about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. And it's super high. It's one of the biggest mountains in that region, 9,000 to 10,000 feet above sea level. And it, one commentator noted that it actually is probably the only mountain range in Jerusalem that could produce snow because of the high elevation. And a lot of scholars actually disagree on, on whether or not they're speaking of this as a literal dew from, from Mount Hermon or if it's figurative. And guess what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter if it's figurative or otherwise because what we see in the scriptures, the idea of do is symbolic in several different ways. But if you look at each of these th various examples throughout the scriptures, we can really narrow it down to a blessing or a provision to God's people. It's a blessing to God's people. It's his favor coming down to his people. Here's one example from Genesis 27. Isaac here blesses Jacob. He says here, saying, may God give you of the dew of the heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. It was a blessing. It was his provision amongst his people. And there's also a sense of refreshment. You ever been to a, a patio, eating at a restaurant in the middle of the summer? What do they always have? Those misters coming down for a moment or two. It's nice and refreshing. Then it just gets sticky and gross. God's dew is not sticky and gross. I'll tell you that right now. Two of these three feasts, if you think about it too, were actually during the hotter months of the year. So when, you, when, when, the, when the people are reciting this poem or this, this psalm and singing this psalm, it's actually to them, it's going to be a great reminder of, of God's refreshment and his care over his people as they're traveling and journeying to their destination. And I think that's a neat idea too. And I vividly remember a, a, a similar, similar refreshment that my family faced back in June of 2015. Back in June of 2015, Gabrielle's doctors and our family decided that we were going to give get, uh, Gabrielle a, a feeding tube so she can eat. Before that, Carol and I were talking about that this morning, before that she was not keeping food down. She didn't know how to swallow. 
She couldn't swallow and keep that food down, so she wasn't nourished. So we made that decision to get a feeding tube put in her so she can be nourished and have the nutrients that she needed to be well. And it was a hard decision, as you can imagine. She was only two years old at the time. She was a tiny little thing. But the refreshment that I'm speaking of happened after we we left her and had her push back into the surgery room, and we went back on the waiting room. And we saw Pat and Mary. We saw Carol. You were there. A couple other brothers and sisters that were there to support us. I tell you what, if you've never experienced that before, having that comfort just kind of overwhelm you in a time of desperate need, ah, it's magical. It was incredible just knowing that they were there. They didn't have to be, but they were. And they didn't even have to say anything. Their presence enough was so overwhelming for our family. It was refreshing. It gave us joy. That's unity. That's brotherhood. That's what the church should be doing. And that's what we experienced. And I tell you what, that was one of the many, many things that confirmed this was our church home. That was one of the many things that confirmed that for us during that time. It pleases God. The Lord blesses that. And we've seen it firsthand. Here's something I want to point out before we kind of go to that second question, though. There's this picture, and you'll see it. It doesn't exactly enter, entertain itself very well in the, in the English translation, but there's this picture of the, uh, of the oil coming down, and, and, and we see that twice in that reference of the oil, and then that dew obviously is coming down from the mountain to refresh the people. What that should remind us of, and I'm hoping that that's exactly what it does, it should remind us that it is God who brings those blessings down to his people. It's God who brings that blessing down. We can work our tails off and do as much as we can for those blessings, but ultimately it is God who brings that down. It's God who provides. It's God who blesses. It's God who does that. And I need that reminder a lot because sometimes I work really, really hard and I don't see any results. But I need to remember that it's God who produces those results. It's God who does that. And I think that's a a reminder for us that there's something that we can't work up to. We're not able to cause that on our own. God will bring those blessings down to us. And that's one of the pictures we see there. So how do we be together? How are we supposed to be together? This psalm was a little difficult to pull out that specific application because there's not a ton there. So what I want to do instead is we're going to look at three New Testament passages that help us to understand unity a little bit better. And we're using three passages, and I'm not putting it really in in, in order of importance. It's more aligned with the order of appearance. Okay, so we're looking at three passages. First one we're going to look at is is John's recording of Jesus' high priestly prayer that we saw in reference a little bit earlier. John 17, this was the prayer that Jesus made right before he was arrested in the garden. Right before his arrest, he was praying these prayer. We'll pick up that prayer in verses 20 and 23. And this is commonly known as the high priestly prayer. So Jesus says this as he's continuing his prayers, like, I do not ask these for, uh, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one just as you Father are in me and I in you, and that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. And I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you had sent me and loved me even as you loved me, them as you have loved me. Jesus is talking about how he's praying to God that his action that he's about to take and being killed for for the salvation of others is going to cause the church to unite. He's saying don't remove them from this earth, but unite them together instead. What a powerful prayer from Jesus our Lord. So the first thing we see here is that we are to be unified in Christ. We are to be unified in Christ. It was so funny when that church down the road here, our church right next door to us, was first being built. There was a number of people who were all upset about it. I can't believe they're building a church right next door. If they're reaching Jesus, go for it. It's okay, right? It's okay. 
And I think, and, and there's no secret that Christians don't agree on everything. Even in this room, I'm sure there's been many disagreements. And that's okay. We're allowed to disagree with one another. But there's a couple things I think we need to understand and pull out and remember. First one comes an example from Paul in 1 Corinthians 12. We won't go there, but in that chapter, he's speaking about a number of things. But one of the things he talks about is, is that we have different parts, that a body, a physical body is made up of different parts. And it's kind of funny because ironically there's two people hobbling around this morning that understand this very perfectly, right? When something is not working right, it's very difficult, right? When, when something's not working the way it's supposed to be working, it's very difficult. Most of us, I'm sure, can relate to that too very, very real in this moment. The usage of those parts, when the hand's not working properly, it's incredibly difficult, in so many different ways. As we consider, if we consider the body as a whole, and we understand that each part is important and relevant, that means any personal preferences that get in the way of our worship together in unity, any of those personal preferences really need to be put aside. What do I mean by personal preferences? It's those things that don't impact the kingdom of God. Many churches have committees. Gratefully, we do not. Many churches have committees about the color of the carpet or the paint on the walls or the color of the lights. Those are not things that are significant in the kingdom of God. Are they important aesthetically? Sure. But they're not essential in the kingdom of God. And that's where we need to put those differences aside and we need to be united because we get to worship God together. And that's what's important. Those are things that are unnecessary and sometimes very harmful for the body of Christ. So one of the things I think we can shift here and understand better is that means that we need to have joy being around other Christians. One church, I won't name its name, and it's as a, a church denomination. Back in the COVID days, they, they literally came out with a statement saying that, that the church members can put aside their obligation of Sunday worship. If we're looking at Worship as an obligation, we're not looking at worship in the right way. We need to be joyful about being around brothers and sisters. This should be something we look forward to every single week in those other times in the week where we get to gather with our brothers and sisters. I worked at a call center for a little over a year right before uh, taking this job full-time and this, this vocation full-time. And there was a gentleman by the name of Mark who found out I was a Christian. I found out he was a Christian, and it was like love at first sight. We were just, every time I was on site, he had to come visit me, and we just talked about the things of God. So good. You know, so there's days where I'm on site, and I'm like, is Mark here today? And I'm like, oh, no, Mark's off. I'm like, come on. Where's my brother? Where's my brother? I need this guy. He gives me a little bit of encouragement as I go throughout my day. And it was, that's the kind of unity, like, we meet somebody who's a brother, like, yay, let's go talk. Let's go celebrate the Lord in conversation together. We look forward to those, op- those conversations. We should have that same thing when we're speaking with brothers and sisters inside the church and outside the church. Next thing we see is, is an example from the early church in the book of Acts. Early church, those first couple of, of chapters in the book of Acts, it speaks about the early church, the spread of the gospel, and how those churches were formed and how they focused their attention. We'll pick up in uh, chapter 2, verses 42. Luke writes these words, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done throughout, through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the pro- proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. God did some incredible things in the early church, and he continues to do that around the world today. But here's another way we can say that, and it's really from verse 46, that we are to engage in fellowship day by day. Engage in fellowship day by day. And notice how the early church did this. It's under the teaching of the apostles, It was through fellowship and breaking bread. A lot of people think this is a direct reference to the Lord's table. 
which it could be, through prayer, through coming together, through community, serving, and providing for one another's needs. That's what the early church looked like. And what did it say the result of that was? They grew mat, you know, a lot. Num- their day, added the number day by day, those who were being saved. It was a community effort to bring souls to Jesus. And I think we do a good job here at this church of doing that. When we're known, when we know there's a problem, when we know there's a need, I think we come together quite well in serving that need. And I think that's precisely, though, why we need to do life together, even outside these four walls. Because that's really when you get to know people. And that's really when you get to know the struggles that they might be going through, is when you interact outside of this formal gathering and in those informal times, or even in small groups sometimes as well. And then think about fellowships, like, okay, so we're, we're told to be amongst other people and, and fellowship day by day. That fellowship that we have, and you can read the, the First John, it tells you about that a lot, that fellowship that we have is also with the Father when we're reading our Bibles each day, when we're praying each day. Those things are included in this general idea of fellowship. And finally, we see Paul's example in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 4 is a great unity chapter of the Bible of Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with all patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is of one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one who that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What a great passage from Paul. And here's what I think he encourages in verse 1 is, is that we need to be a good witness for Christ. We need to be a good witness for Christ. And he says that we do that through humility and gentleness, patience and love. Gentleness, humility, patience, and love. Those are the characteristics, he says, of people who can be good witnesses. So I challenge you to ask yourself sometimes, is that how others see you? Is that how others see you as being gentle and humble and patient and loving? Think about the impact that you can have to others outside of the family of God when you exhibit that to them. Because aren't we hoping, aren't we praying, aren't we... Aren't we praying for their salvation? Don't we want them to become a part of this family of God? And it does require sometimes just our actions so we can develop relationships, so we can open up that door and invite them to know Jesus. When Christians live in unity, the world does see it. And more than that, when we don't live in unity, the, the world sees it. And they may not, and, and hopefully that challenges them and it drives them to have a desire to be a part of this family that we are in. And it's essential that we're good witnesses to Christ. We've seen this morning in this passage that when the church is united, the Lord blesses. And I think when that occurs, it occurs when we can do our part, and when we do our part, we can allow this to occur as well. And we receive that blessing by being united in Christ. We receive that blessing by being in fellowship with the Lord and his people and by being a good witness to those outside the family of God. And that should be the goal of every church. That should be the goal of every family. That should be the goal of every member of the family of God. And at the end of verse 3, there's another blessing that David talks about, and that's of, of life forevermore. And once again, as we opened and as we start to close this series, that's the journey that we've been talking about that journey to life forevermore, that journey that we get to take as members of the family of God to that final destination, that place where we get to worship God in eternity. So my question to you this morning is, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? And if you are, pastor and author Mike Leak, he summed up the Psalms like this. He says that someday, all those who are in Christ will be finally home. Revelation 21 paints a beautiful picture which goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, namely God with his people. 
Revelation 21 is the culmination of God's plan to rescue all that which was lost in the fall. Our heart's desire to be home will finally and fully be fulfilled. But in the meantime, just as those post-exilic period who compiled the Psalms of Ascent, we wait and we journey forward, and we trek and we climb to further experience the presence of God. That's what we get to look forward to. And I tell you this, I don't think there's any better way to experience this journey aside from the family of God. Because really, if you think about it, if you have to go through a long life that possibly comes with struggles, and if we take this road, isn't the road better traveled with family? I think it is. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for giving us a place of worship. Thank you for people that we get to call family, that we get to fellowship with each week. We pray, God, that you bring others into our family and into our fold so we can continue to grow, not just for the sake of numbers, God, but just for the sake of unity and family. We want to please you, Father, by being a united people. We want to please you, Father, by, by serving one another, by loving one another, and by gathering together. So I pray, God, that if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know you, Father, I pray, God, that you reach their hearts and that they know you, and they know you today, Father, and they want to follow you and change their life accordingly. I pray, God, that if there's anybody here that just, we're watching online perhaps, that have issues with the church and they just don't want to be a part of a church body and a local church because of all the possible problems that might face, well, we're a bunch of imperfect people, God. But we know that there is strength in unity. We know that there's blessings that come with unity. So I pray, God, that if there's disagreements, if there's, there's issues, if there's problems, that you help us to refocus our attention, not on those things, but instead on the kingdom of God, and let that be our driving force to why we worship. Let that be the driving force of why we praise you, and why we sing praises to your name, and why we open up the scriptures, and why we, we come to our knees in prayer. And I pray for anybody who might be suffering this morning, knowing, God, that there is a journey that we're on, but that final destination is perfect. And I pray, God, that you help us to see that, help us to look forward to that, and we ask that in Jesus' holy name. Amen.